So yeah, I'm going to talk about the Zeno effect for quantum computation and control. This is joint work uh, with Gerardo Pes Silva, Ali Rizakani, and Daniel Lidar. So we've got sort of the, uh, the typical situation that we've seen all, all week here. We've got n qubits and some uncontrollable bath, unknown bath that's going to uh, act on these qubits. Um, uh, as far as notation, we're going to split the Hamiltonian up into a system bath and interaction terms as usual and have uh, a unitary propagation on, on the composite system. All right. So the issue is we've got decoherence, of course, because of that, that bath, and how can we deal with it? And we've seen a number of methods this week, passive methods like decoherence-free subspaces, active methods, closed-loop methods like quantum error correction, and, and open-loop methods like dynamical coupling. And we're going to add one more uh, open loop method, which is the quantum Zeno effect. So this goes back to the 1970s. Uh, it's a well-known for protection of given states with projective measurements, although uh, uh, other work since, since the 70s has extend, extended that to um, more general uh, uh, types of measurements, uh, as well as protecting uh, subspaces as well, uh, instead of just given particular states. So what we want to do is protect an arbitrary state or subspace using the quantum Zeno effect. And we want to try and understand, try and quantify how well we can do this with finite uh, resources. right? The, so the Zeno effect typically is, is looking at infinitely many measurements. But what happens if we do a finite me number of, of uh, non-projective measurements? So just, just to review, the, 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 uh, the Zeno effect is, is this idea where you can do uh, many measurements and uh, by doing that, you basically slow down, freeze the, the dynamics of the, of the system uh, so that the, the watch pod never boils. So we're going to do these, these m measurements in some finite time interval, capital T. And I want both m and t to be finite. So I mentioned we're going to do non-projective measurements. We want weak measurements. So what that means is a weak interaction between the system and the, uh, the measurement apparatus or, or, the, or the probe. And um, the, the way that we describe this is, is with uh, sort of a, an interpolation parameter, this, this, this parameter epsilon. Oh, had it for a second. There it is. Uh, which which uh, parameterizes the, the strength of the measurement from epsilon equals 0, which is basically no measurement at all, to epsilon equal infinity, which is a projective measurement. So. So how do we do this? How do we set up a, a Zeno effect and, and, uh, and do it with the weak measurements to, to, to uh, protect arbitrary states from, from this environment? So the, the basic idea is we're going to incorporate some ideas from, from uh, quantum error correction. We're going to make a stabilizer uh, quantum error correction code that uh, encode the initial state. We're going to then weakly measure the stabilizer elements from that group. And then simultaneously to doing that, we can uh, think about doing some, some uh, uh, degree of, of computation and control by using the logical operators. Since they will commute with our measurement operators, we can kind of uh, slide those in there. And I want to emphasize the point that we're not doing error correction. We're not closing the loop and correcting the errors. We're just doing frequent uh, detection of those errors. So OK, again, we're taking an unknown state for, in, in some known code for some finite time. And, and again, this, this system Hamiltonian that we, that we talked about. Um, these, these two parameters I want to emphasize, J, J0 and, and J1, are going to be parameters that we're going to use in this, in this formulation. So we're going to grab the, the norm of the system and, and bath Hamiltonians together and, and the norm of uh, the, the interaction term. And then we've got this solution, uh, super operator uh, from the Hamiltonian. And we make this assumption that, that the, the bath interaction is at most d minus 1 local. So that, that ensures that our system uh, bath interaction term uh, is a linear combination of errors that will be uh, detected by this code. So we encode into the stabilizer uh, group G. And then the, the protocol is just this very simple thing of, of, of uh, free evolution punctuated by measurements. And we do that m times over the course of, of, of the time interval t. And the projection, or the, well, P here is, is, the, is the measurement, sort of a weak projection, if you like. Uh, it's the measurement of again, um, either all of the uh, elements of the stabilizer group or just the generators of that group. So, so there's two different uh, protocols that we can look at. So in order to sort of evaluate how well we're doing, we, we describe this, this distance metric between the, um, 
or, or the, the, the final state, rather, uh, having applied this, this Zeno protocol, uh, compared to what the dynamics would have been if we had no system bath interaction. So we just had this, the, the internal Hamiltonians of the system in bath, but no interaction term. So that's row not in this, in this notation. So I, I, I mentioned that we want to try and quantify how well we can do with, with uh, finite resources. So we're going to try and uh, decompose this distance, try to, try to develop a bound for this distance that we can easily compute with the parameters that we've got at hand. So I can't really go into the details. They're, they're kind of painful and shocking and, and um, uh, well, tedious, to, to say the least. But uh, just to give a, give a little outline here, it, it, we can decompose the dynamics using the, the Dyson series. Um, we can use basically the algebraic structure of stabilizer codes, these, these error subspaces that decompose the terms of the, of the Dyson series into those various subspaces and then apply a bunch of triangle inequalities and, and so forth. And what we get is uh, a triple sum in which the, the, the sum n looks like a combinatorial type of a, of a, 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 a quantity. So there are binomial coefficients and, and exponentials in there. And so that, that, that series is, is what's known as a hypergeometric series. And um, that brings us to the, the mathematical nun here. So this is Sister Mary Celine Faisenmeyer, who did some nice work back in the 40s, uh, where she, she uh, came up with some paper and pencil methods that were quite simple, but, but really nice for uh, evaluating these types of uh, hypergeometric series. Um, and what, what she came up with was a way of basically searching for uh, linear recurrence relations that are satisfied by these, by these uh, series. So she was interested in special functions. These, these series show up in a lot of places, and including special functions. So she was interested in evaluating that. But these methods have been uh, developed and, and generalized and, and uh, optimized and turned into uh, packages for Mathematica and Maple and these, these computer algebra systems. So um, for at least certain subclasses of these series, you can just basically plug them in and, and get out an answer. Uh, it turns out that our, our series is a little bit different. It has um, non-standard boundary conditions, essentially, and, and that, that uh, introduces sort of an inhomogeneity into that thing. But, but most of this comes out right from this, this work. And if we use these types of methods, we can get what, what's going to look like probably an ugly expression for, the, for this bound. And it's not going to get any prettier when I show you what, what the notation actually is. Um, but the nice piece of this is that these are closed expressions. And they involve only the, the half dozen uh, parameters that we talked about, the, the norms of the Hamiltonian terms, uh, the, the, the number of measurements, m, uh, the, the final time, the, the size of the, of the stabilizer group, and, these, and the strength of the measurement. So we can just plug those things right in. And we, so, so we'd like to try and analyze this a little bit further and understand, is it a good bound, for example, and, and what is it really telling us about the behavior of this, of this method? Are we, are we actually realizing a Zeno effect using these weak measurements? So what we can show is that actually for any uh, measurement strength, uh, uh, greater than 0 at least, um, this, th we can expand around uh, m equal infinity, m being the number of measurements again. And we can see that we get this 1 over m behavior going on here. So, so it is converging to 0 as, as, as m grows. We are realizing a Zeno effect no matter what the strength of, of the measurement is. Um, and I'll, I'll point out that basically the strength of the measurement shows up in this, in this term here. So if, if, this, if the measurements are uh, projective, epsilon is infinity, and this, this, this term becomes 0. So that vanishes. And so this term is, is, is the only one that shows up in the projective limit. Uh, in the other limit, when epsilon is going to zero, this thing dominates. This becomes this grows to infinity. So the rate of convergence of this thing, even though it's, it's one over m for any arbitrary epsilon, the rate of convergence is is, is in, uh, it, well, it's decreasing as as uh, as epsilon decreases, as, as the strength of the measurement decreases. So I mentioned these these two. Uh, variations on the protocol, one where we're measuring the full stabilizer group, and one where we're measuring just uh, the generators of that group. And so there, there are trade-offs between the two. Um, obviously, if you're just measuring the generators, it's an exponentially fewer measurements that you have to do at each, at each iteration. Um, but with the, the caveat that the, that the behavior, at least of this bound, uh, shows slower convergence. So this. Uh, the, the, the Q here, which was related to the, the size of the stabilizer code, 
uh, is replaced by a one in the case where you go to the, the generators only. So it's a, it's a little bit slower convergence. Oh, come on. So we can just plot out what, what, the, what the bound looks like for, for a certain uh, set of parameters here. We've, so we've chosen uh, uh, J naught T to be, to be one, and, and uh, the number of generators to be four, and this, um, the, the size of the interaction to be one tenth of the size of the, of the system in Bath Hamiltonians themselves. And so you can see the, the bottom surface here is, is just when we take the limit uh, uh, with uh, of, of, of epsilon going to zero. So this is the, the limit of strong measurements, this, this purple surface here. And then the, the middle surface is the uh, full stabilizer group. It's converge, converging very quickly. And then the, when you do the generators only, it converges a little bit less quickly. So let's uh, recap here. We've, we've got this. This uh, method for, or this this protocol for uh, uh, for protecting uh, systems from from uh, from the uh, effects of the environment, we've got this rigorous uh, distance bound that we've been able to come up with that characterizes how well we can do with finite resources um, in this, in this scheme. Um, uh, I didn't really show it, but what you can what you can show is that uh, it doesn't really matter whether the, the Hamiltonian is, is time dependent or time independent. The, the Dyson expansion will work either way. So you've got uh, uh, the potential for application to adiabatic quantum computing. Um, and I mentioned that we could potentially also use the logical operators of the code to do uh, to do computation while we're protecting these things. And I'll just mention briefly that uh, what I showed you here was was a result for non-selective measurements. So that uh, that final state that I that I talked about uh, is basically the average stable average over all possible uh, measurement outcomes. But we'd like to know what happens if we consider all of the all the, the individual possible uh, measurement outcomes, all the uh, possible outcome states. Uh, is it just the average that's con that's that's converging in this nice way, or is it um, sort of a, a concentration of measure that's happening? So that uh, with high probability, you're, you're uh, getting near the, the, uh, the ideal state that, we, that we're looking for. So I'll thank you for your attention. Uh, if you repeatedly do the same weak measurements, then that converges to a strong measurement. So it's not surprising that if you keep the measurement strength constant and let the number of measurements go to infinity that you get a Zeno effect. But uh, I have a question. If you measure all of the elements of a stabilizer versus measuring only the generators, from measuring the generators, you would, because that's, you know, that gives you the, the full information about the whole stabilizer, um, you, you, you could deduce from if, if it were a strong measurement, you could deduce the outcome of a measurement of any element of the stabilizer just from measuring the generators. So is the effect of it converging more rapidly when you measure the whole stabilizer just that you're doing more measurements? In other words, would, would just uh, measuring the generator, if the ratio between the generators and the whole thing is n, if you just did n times as many measurements of the generators, would that be just the same as measuring the, uh, the whole stabilizer? It's a little hard to tell, um, the, just because what we're looking at here is, the, is this bound that we've created. And it, certainly in the bound, it doesn't look quite that, that clear cut. Um, but, but I think there's something saying that, that, uh, that the, the additional measurements are, are contributing in, in, in that sort of a way, that you're not gaining any new infor information, really. But, but yeah, I think, that's, I think that's pretty close. Yes, we did. For the, for the purpose of this anal uh, analysis, yes, we did. <laughs> so many body measurements are not always easy to come by. Yeah. I'm wondering if you thought about physical systems where this could be implemented. Uh, for example, when I was watching your talk, Hideo Mabuchi's uh, proposal from this morning came to mind. But have you thought about other physical systems where this might work? I, I have not. Easily adapted? Uh, largely because I'm not a physicist, really, but uh, we we have considered other possibilities of, of extending this beyond uh, the stabilizer code formalism to think of ba uh, potentially the Bacon Shore code and, and two-body measurements in that case. 
in complete opposition to the spirit of this conference. Do you have an anti-Zeno effect here also? Can you get an anti-Zeno? Again, it's hard to say because, because we're only looking at this bound. It's, it's certainly possible that sort of in the, in the um, introductory part of that, of that protocol that something bad is happening, but it's, it's kind of uh, hard to see in, 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 this, in this analysis. Let us thank him again. And uh, <laughs> going to be Peter Brooks, who is going to talk about uh, asymmetric papers.